Hello, everyone. Uh, Hi. I'm Jamie Anderson, and with me is... Yes, I'm Richard James. So, Richard, uh, obviously, we're going to be talking about all sorts of things in the world of Jerry Anderson. Uh, I am the son of Jerry Anderson, for those of you who don't know, so it's it's great to meet you. Um, Richard, what is your connection to the world of Jerry Anderson? Um, back in the early 1990s, I was uh, fortunate enough to play the role of Officer Hubble Orrin in uh, Jerry's last live action TV series called Space Precinct, which we shot at Pinewood Studios in, gosh, 1994, 95, I think, a long time ago. Uh, yes, when I was uh, just a, a wee lad with a full head of hair. Yes. Um, but that's that's where we met. And since then, you've become um, ingrained, I suppose, in the worlds of Jerry Anderson with the, the podcast and uh, authoring books and stuff. Right. Uh, one of those books that we're going to talk about right now. So uh, it's, you know, Jerry Anderson to most people means, well, Thunderbirds and Space 1999 and uh, UFO and Captain Scarlet. I mean, there are many, many series, but those are probably what will be regarded as the, the crown jewels. But as we regularly discuss, there are loads of properties that Dad never fully realised. Little ideas on scraps of paper through to full scripts and treatments, all sorts of things. One of those was a project called Five Star Five. That. Now, to many of you, <laughs> it's a lovely logo, isn't it? To many of you, it won't mean a thing. Yeah. But I can basically say that this was Dad's answer to Star Wars. Um, it's uh, an aborted film script from the 1970s, and uh, Richard has taken it, taken it on and turned it into a novel, which we then turned into an audio book, which will be released uh, very, very soon. Uh, but we thought we would talk to you about this lost Jerry Anderson gem, uh, where it came from, how it didn't come to be, how it finally has come to be, uh, and the sort of things you can expect, as well as what else we're doing in the in the world of Jerry Anderson. So, Richard, I'm surprising you here because I've got some exclusive clips of Dad talking about Five Star Five. Oh. So, should we hear from the man himself about how it came to be? Yes, yes. His dad. John Redway introduced me to Sydney Rose and <clears throat> it seemed that Sydney w was going to be able to raise the money so we decided that we would um, co-produce a feature film and the director was going to be a very famous director, very famous director and he agreed that he would do the picture. So, amazing. John Redway was dad's agent at the time and he needed an agent and he was looking uh, for, uh, you know, additional work in the kind of po post space 1999 era when he no longer had this partnership with Lou Grade. John met Sidney Rose, who was a, a known producer at the time, I believe, and they decided they were going to embark on this epic sci fi course. Now, that director that dad didn't remember the name of, very famous director, uh, do you know a film called Towering Inferno? Yes, that's right. John Gwillamin, it was. That's right. That Jerry was it, Burnham. yes. Uh, Death on the Nile as well was one of his. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, jo John, uh, I've heard referred to as the most famous director you've never heard of. I have to be honest, I've no I I was not familiar with his work other than knowing Tower Inferno. So they had this fantastic director lined up, this great, this great script. He worked with Tony Barwick. Well, actually, I've got another nice clip about what Dad thought of the script himself. Uh -huh. Um, as far as I remember, I wrote the script with Tony Barwick and it was a bloody good script. It was a, a real, a real, real action piece. Um, it was budgeted out at $11 million, which is a lot of money at that time. <laughs> $11 million is a lot of money now, I'd say. <laughs> So, so clearly, Dad was very proud of the the script. So, without giving anything away, from your perspective of reading that script for the first time, Richard, what did you think of it? Did you think it was a bloody good script? <laughs> of course, I did. It had everything that you would expect from a Jerry Anderson script, actually co-written, as he said there, with Tony Barwick. Um, but a fantastic group of characters, uh, quite adorable characters, some of them. Uh, epic set pieces. Uh, it really is a space opera in the vein of Star Wars. It seems to me that this is the direction that Jerry would love to have gone. It's a shame it didn't happen. But, you know, following Space 1999 on TV, he obviously saw the way forward 
as being uh, a cinema writer and producer of huge, epic sci-fi uh, stories. Yeah, it was exactly what he wanted to do for his entire career, go into this area of, of making epics. Uh, and he'd, now he'd found his footing so, so well uh, in the world of science fiction, it seemed to make sense. Yeah. Uh, now, $11 million was a big budget then. I mean, it, it's a lot of money now. Uh, I mean, it will probably be, I guess, the equivalent of 80 to 100 million currently, I would think, in, in the movie world. So you can very much think of it along the lines of kind of Marvel-esque stuff in terms of its scope. It was going to be pretty massive. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you read the script, you can see absolutely where all that money would have gone because yeah. it would have been an effects laden extravaganza almost every scene is, is got uh, uh, you know a, a, a spaceship in space or, or a, a, a battle in, in you know in, in space or a, a strange location or a weird character yeah lots of before. lots of ships spaceports yeah. invasions yeah. armies i mean it was going to be massive yeah. so i guess the question is what happened to this production why why did it not go ahead so i've got the start of a story um, our final clip for now from, from Dad, and I can tell you what happened at the end of it. So um, here's how it didn't go ahead. And we went into uh, pre-production with a signed contract. But the contract was signed by somebody who turned out not to, to be not a British national. So at a later date, we found that the contract was invalid. But furthermore, um, <clears throat> the first tranche of money was due and it didn't turn up. And we had already started engaging people and uh, got a telex from a bank, a foreign bank, to say the first tranche of money will be with you in 48 hours. And on that basis we made certain commitments. I thought I was being smart because I tell it I tell it to the bank back and said, Are you bank whatever it was? And they replied, Yes, we are. So I thought, well, we've got a telex from the bank saying a million dollars on its way. Must be all right. Wow. Must be all right, he says. Yeah. Now as the story goes, they had this telex, uh, and for if you're uh, younger than, well, a certain age, then a, a telex was a kind of strip of strip of paper, essentially, like a a, a slim line fax reel. Yeah, so. Is that about right? I think so. Yeah. Um, so they received this telex, um, went back and said, "Can you confer, confirm the bank details?" And they said, "Yeah, that's us. Great." And it was from the bank. But what had happened was uh, that allegedly one of uh, Sidney Rose's partners in this had gone to this bank abroad, hoping to strike a deal and get the money together for the financing, uh, came out to the meeting uh, with the bank manager, which had been unsuccessful, and then said to the telex operator at the bank, um, can you send a message for me? And she said, um, oh, I would do, but I'm about to go out on my lunch. Right. And the guy said, oh, well, don't worry. I know how to use a telex machine. I'll, I'll do it while you go. Is that all right? She said yes. And so this guy sent a, a fraudulent message, essentially, wow. from, a, from a foreign bank's telex yeah. saying, you know, this is bank X, whatever. Yeah. A million dollars has been sent and will be with you in 48 hours. I guess in the hope that in that 48-hour window, they might be able to bring the finance together elsewhere. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that really happens in the world of independent film. It's, you know, terrifying. Yeah. So, I mean, in the run-up to this, they had actually engaged uh, artists for pre-production art. Mm -hmm. um, any of you who do know Five Star Five may have seen some of the, the artwork that was produced. I don't know what you've seen, Richard, but I can share a few bits and pieces with you now. Yes, do. Uh, uh -huh. the, the Space Caravan. Yeah. The Five Star Five. Uh-huh, yeah. The Encampment. I mean, you can see a certain style to these, right? Absolutely. And these, I think, all by Michael Stringer, yeah. who was uh, going to be the production designer. Nice. So you can see sort of the start of this kind of epic scope for what the film was going to be like. Uh, and they even had a little poster put together. Yeah, <laughs> lovely. For something that 
then sadly it never came to be. Mm. So many years later, um, I guess 2013, I discovered uh, a script. And there's a little uh, still at the front page in dad's filing cabinet and uh, had a read and thought, oh, I didn't even know about it at the time. Found out a little bit about it from mum. And um, and it's been sat there ever since. And then we chatted about doing something with it. I can't remember when. How how did this actually happen? Where we we went? What should we do with this unused film script? I know Richard James can novelise it. He's the man. <laughs> well, I think over the last sort of couple of years, Jamie, you've been looking at expanding the uh, the archive even further and actually bringing lots of these legacy projects to life so people can see them. Uh, so very recently, uh, last year, I adapted uh, the pilot episode of, Demeter, of, of Space Precinct, uh, which was never shown, called Demeter City, um, as a, a novelization and, and an audio book, and uh, then a few more uh, original stories, new stories for Space Precinct. Um, and uh, you were looking to expand on, on that. Um, you released various other audio books, which I know you're going to mention shortly. And I had, by that point, spoken to you about Five Star Five as a thing of interest. Uh, and I think you simply said, well, do you want to do anything else? How about Five Star Five? <laughs> and I hadn't actually read the script at that point, but I had seen by the Jerry Anderson website, uh, the opening scene, or a, a part of the opening scene, which was really, uh, really punchy and uh, would have really, I think, locked you into your seat if you'd been in the cinema watching that uh, first scene unfold. Uh, and I thought, well, absolutely. This, Of course I want to adapt this. Firstly, uh, to bring it to the world so other people can see this this lost project and secondly as a kind of um an historical record piece really just to make it a thing to finally uh bring it you know in, into the public domain uh, rather yeah. than being a, a script in a drawer somewhere because that's such a shame for any project just to end up you know languishing in a place like that yeah i mean it's and it's languished for a long time it's been sat there since 1979 untouched um and it's kind of kind of sad like you say for it not to be out there and for fans not to be able to experience it absolutely so what is the process like from taking a, something from script to to novelization especially when you have the weight of legacy and expectation Mm. On you know, it's not like oh here's a here's an unknown feature script from an unknown writer. Oh, I like the idea. I'll I'll do my own thing with it. There must be kind of guardrails for you. Yes, I suppose so. I felt duty bound to stick to it as much as possible, which actually makes for quite a punchy read. So essentially, the chapters are the scenes, pretty much. Uh, so if you have a short scene, well, that's a short punchy chapter, and that's quite nice. So it gives you the sense that you're actually watching the film rather than perhaps reading the book. Um, I didn't tinker with, with, with the plot as such, uh, just some sort of minor alterations. You know, we're now, what, 40 years later, and uh, times have changed and attitudes have changed. I'm not saying there was anything terrible in the original script at all, uh, but some of the relationships I felt needed sharpening a little bit and perhaps looking at with a modern eye. Um, but aside from that, it's pretty much intact. Uh, it's a really strong story. Uh, it's a very simple story in a sense. It is literally good against evil. And who doesn't like a story uh, <laughs> like that? And it's an Anderson course, staple. Absolutely. And at a time like this, given the year that we've all just been through, it's a piece of escapism. It really is. And I think perhaps we've all got a bit of an appetite for that at the moment. So, yeah, didn't change too much. Uh, a couple of names. Uh, there's one great scene where, uh, of course, in the 1970s, if you had a charismatic leading man, it was obvious that any female character was going to fall for him immediately <laughs> and, uh, uh, and pretty soon jump into bed with him in, in all likelihood. And that sort of is intimated in the original scene. And I thought, well, I'm not sure we buy this anymore. I think that the female character, Colonel Zana, is a little more uh, dominant, actually, or should be, um, particularly given that the scene took place immediately after Lovell, the male character, uh, starts to pine after his dead wife, <laughs> and then within moments he's seducing this, uh, uh, this woman. <laughs> I thought, well, that, that doesn't just doesn't suit. Yeah. These days, you know. So little moments like that, I just just tidied up. Yeah, but those are things I think that Dad would have done himself if it was a reimagined. Very much in the same way that they, you know, made some changes on New Captain Scarlet to bring things into line with 
more contemporary sensibilities. Yeah, and that will um, always in forty years' time, you'll look back on what I've done with it and think, "Well, we've changed that now." Absolutely, oh, I wouldn't have Richard James do that again. No, quite. <laughs> um, right. In terms of it being like other Anderson shows, you know, obviously this is this comes in this, in a post space nineteen ninety nine period, so I, I, I'm guessing there are lots of similarities there, but it. it in a lot of ways, it feels quite different in scale and scope. Most Anderson things are earthbound or to some degree, or at least yeah. exist somewhere within our solar system or somewhere that was within our solar system. Yes. Um, so how, how does this compare and contrast to other Anderson stuff that you know? I think in terms of scope and scale, I think Space 1999 is certainly its, its nearest cousin, really. And as you say, that, that would be no surprise. But... In terms of, it's odd, isn't it, to talk about the design of the piece, because it's not actually a visual work, is it? But it's a grimier, grittier, dirtier place than uh, Moonbase Alpha ever was. Mm. Um, and probably, oh, we never really saw that in the Anderson universe on TV, did we? Uh, well, I would say we... not until Space Precinct, uh, well, is yes, what I'm I thinking. Going... That's right, where, where Demeter City is sort of this Blade Runner-esque uh, hmm. dystopian um, sort of a society, isn't it? There's a, there's a touch of that, certainly. Yeah. Um, but there are moments in it that you can absolutely see uh, were written in 1979, were never used, of course, but your dad very cannily kept them up there in his, uh, in his little filing cabinet in his, in his brain and pulled them out when, when they were needed. There's a great sequence where one of the characters, um, he's very proficient in sort of psychic judo, so from the corner of the room, he can throw all these shapes and punches and kicks, and you, at uh, 20 feet away, will feel the effect of it. Uh, an idea which was to resurface later in an episode of Space Precinct called Two Against the Rock. Uh, so, you know, a good idea never dies, does it? Absolutely. Well, Dad, Dad would always hold on to these things. Um, I mean, my... But Go on, that please. Was, I about to say, just, just lots of echoes, really, of other... And the idea of, you know, a group of... Uh, of um, specialized individuals getting together to defeat an alien foe uh, could be you know that's the tracy family right there really isn't it i suppose yeah um, so people yeah. will certainly feel that there is something um almost sort of reassuring uh in in how uh like previous anderson productions this would have been yeah well i'm so glad that we at least get uh two, two ways to enjoy it, even if not on the big screen so um your novel will be out as a hardback um in early june alongside uh, an audio version um there's our lovely cover yeah. by marcus stamps which starts to give you a sense of the kind of um interstellar universal nature of the uh the piece yeah uh, together with an audiobook, yeah, read by Robbie Stevens, sound designed by Benji Clifford, and some music as well. Um, you've heard some early blasts of that, and uh, ha how do you feel about it being brought to life that way? Uh, it, just extraordinary. I mean, it, you know, it really does lift it to another level, doesn't it? Uh, it's very immersive, the, the stuff that mm. Benji's done with the sound effects and little bits of music and so on. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Of course, Robbie Stevens, uh, Jerry Anderson fans might know from his uh, voice work on uh, previous series like... Um, uh, Terra Hawks and and new Captain Scarlet, in fact, Indeed. Captain Blue and new Captain Scarlet. Yeah, um, so it's great to great to keep it in the family. And I should just say, of course, that a few weeks ago, just when I finished it, you, you got in touch with Jamie, didn't you, and said uh, it's five star five, sure, but can we think of like a almost a subheading, a subtitle, perhaps, just in case there are further adventures to be had, uh, which is where we came up with uh, John Lovell and the Zargon Fret, which is a fantastic sort of Saturday matinee b-movie title isn't it which fits it perfectly it it felt very much like if you know if they if this was progressing back in the back in the day yeah um and the financiers are saying well what are we going to do next you know if this is five stuff five, what are you going to call it five stuff five two that's too many numbers uh so you know very much in the in the vein of indiana jones and yeah um that kind of yeah. thing that's what we're thinking so yeah maybe there could be further adventures of uh, of john d lovell if you Who want knows? readers and listeners. Yeah, exactly. You'll have to give it a go. Now, that there, there's a, a five-minute sample on the Jerry Anson YouTube channel. If you want to pop along to there, youtube.com slash Jerry Anson TV. And Five Star Five is really just one part of a thread of audio and publishing content that is currently underway. You may have also seen uh, this beauty, 
Thunderbirds Terror from the Stars, a full cast um, enhanced audio book, which is out uh, at the end of this month. Uh, John Colshaw taking over Jeff Tracy and Parker uh, yeah. after David Graham deciding to step back from these major roles as Parker in his 96th year, which I think he probably does deserve a rest, to be fair. fair I hope you'll um, get a copy, though. Of course he'll get a copy, 100%. He's written us a lovely forward for it, which right. is which is so nice. And and John Colshaw has read, which was quite quite emotional to hear, actually. Yes, yes. But there's there's something in this way of bringing stuff to life uh, via audio, which I think is really special. There's a, you know, so much of Anderson's stuff was visual, of course. You know, the designs of the craft and the, the explosions and all that kind of thing. But imagine watching Thunderbirds or Space 1999 without sound, without the performances from the voice actors and the performers on screen, without the sound effects. Yeah. You know, so little attention is often paid to those amazing sound effects. And without the music, you know, Barry Gray's incredible score, yeah. all, all of which were kind of characters in, in their own right. And there are amazing stories to be told. So Terror from the Stars is the first of a, a new set of new adaptations of John Fladen's books from the 1960s. But there's there's many more to come. In fact, we've just been finalizing auditioning for Stingray, uh, which is also coming back uh, and many others, too. Wow. Um, so we're, we're looking to the past and to the future. But R Richard, for you, especially having written the novel for Five Star Five and then hearing the audios come together and having been in the audios yourself, how do you feel the kind of the, the Anderson audio world compares to the visual? We're not trying to re replace one. It's just another thread for you to enjoy. But what, what about it works? Oh, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think it's only when you hear it in audio only that you realize how much of the picture uh, the audio actually provides. Yeah. It's perfectly possible to listen. And I'm sure many people do. Thunderbirds fans may well have uh, the uh, audio stories of uh, you know, from the 1960s. On vinyl, I think many of them released, weren't they? Mm. They work just as well. That's not to take anything away from the visuals, of course. Oh, of course. But there's something about hearing an audio story that enables you to fill in the visual blanks, as mm. it were. Uh, it's, it's another step up from reading, isn't it? From that just the cold word on the page, which also engages the imagination, as we know. But having the sound and the performances, the vocal performances, you almost get the pictures playing in front of your eyes. It's quite a magical thing, I think. Mm. It is, yeah. It's, it's sort of an extra step you have to take to engage with it, which yeah. just just seems to really work. Yeah. Um, and it's not just uh, Anderson from the past. I sh we should mention First Action Bureau, which yes. is Anderson of the present and future. Yes. There's a the CD box set, which is Look still like available that. from the Jerry Anderson store, uh, which Richard is in, of course. Um, <laughs> Fantastic cast, Genevieve Gaunt, Sash Dewan, Patterson Joseph, Nicola Walker, Richard James and Wayne Forrester. Uh, not in order of importance there, of course. Uh, but First Action Bureau is one of our new creations from the worlds of, of Anderson, um, set in 2068, uh, a much more contemporary, slightly more adult take on, the, on an Anderson show. Series two currently being written, be recorded later this year, uh, and much more to come, as well as uh, other projects in development for the small and big screen, which we hope to uh, keep you informed about in due course, because Richard, as you quite often say, there's brand new Jerry Anderson stuff being made right now. Correct. Yes. And uh, now that's a phrase that Richard always says on the Jerry Anderson podcast. Uh, you can join us there weekly if you would like to keep up to date with the worlds of Anderson. Uh, just uh, search Jerry Anderson podcast on your app of choice and we'll be there for 60, 90, sometimes more minutes uh, every single week with all sorts of stuff from the world of Jerry Anderson. Uh, make sure you pop along to the YouTube channel as well, where you can hear samples of these upcoming audio books. Um, the, the physical versions, the hardbacks and the CDs will be available from the Jerry Anderson store, shop.jerryanderson.co.uk. Digital versions from Big Finish, our friends at bigfinish.com. And um, I guess that sort of brings us neatly to the end of our little segment on Five Star Five, doesn't it? Yeah, how exciting. Uh, Brilliant. Do let us know what you think, listeners and readers mm. at home, uh, if you get a copy. It'd be great to hear what you think of uh, John Lovell and his team, and uh, whether you think there's scope for any more adventures for them. Fingers crossed. I have a feeling there might be. Uh, anyway, thank you for joining us for this discussion of Five Star Five and Anderson Audio and all other things. Richard, thanks for joining us, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Bye. <laughs>